so I want to start by posing a question. Okay. So this is a triangle, and the angles inside of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Now, if I could get you to raise your hand if you just agree with that statement, just in general. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Now, what if I told you that they didn't have to? Okay. First of all, how could such a triangle even be possible? And better yet, what can the story of that triangle's discovery teach us about our perspectives on the world? And to answer both of those gigantic questions, we have to go back to the origin of the triangle, all the way back to 300 BC in ancient Alexandria with a mathematician by the name of Euclid. Now, Euclid's heralded as the father of geometry, and that's a pretty, 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 pretty big title, right? But that's because he founded geometry on the sole foundation of deductive reasoning. And now for those that aren't familiar with deductive reasoning, the fundamental concept goes like this. You may only make new claims that can be justified using claims you've already made. So this has to start somewhere. And Euclid started by identifying five common notions. Statements like, two things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. And before we go on, I find it convenient to visualize the concept of deductive reasoning as a tree. And just for the sake of an incredible pun, right, we're going to call this our geometry. Anybody? <laughs> I was hoping that joke would work. <laughs> anyway, Euclid's five common notions are going to go squarely at the base of this tree. Next, Euclid identified five postulates, or better understood as five basic assumptions. And these assumptions were, given any two points, one, you could connect a line segment between them. Two, you could extend that line segment infinitely in either directions. Three, given that line segment and a point, you can make a circle. Four, all right angles are congruent or the same. And five, two lines cut by another line such that the two angles in between add to 180 degrees are going to be parallel and they'll never touch each other. So those five postulates and assumptions also go at the base of our geometry. Now, using those five assumptions, you could go ahead and start making propositions or statements. Right? So Euclid's first proposition was the construction of an equilateral triangle, or a triangle in which all three sides had the same exact length. And you could actually do this relatively easily using the postulates that we already made. You can make two points and draw two circles about those two points and say that all three sides of the same length by postulate three that we did before. That's not the point. The beautiful part about geometry and the beautiful part about deductive reasoning right, is that now you could go ahead and use that statement about equilateral triangles to go ahead and prove other propositions. In other words, it goes in the base of our tree. And other propositions he did. In fact, over the course of his entire lifetime, Euclid produced 463 propositions over the course of 13 books that has been regarded as probably one of the most incredible feats in all of mathematics. I mean, Euclid was able to make incredible relationships, such as the Pythagorean theorem uh, and even the volume of a cone, just by starting with five basic assumptions. But now I ask you, what happens when one of those assumptions is questioned? So let's revisit that fifth postulate, better known as the parallel postulate. Just as a reminder, the parallel postulate states that two lines that are cut by another line such that the middle two angles add up to 180 degrees are parallel and therefore never touch. If you find that complicated, don't worry, I also find that complicated. It was later proven equivalent to the much easier to understand statement that the angles inside of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Okay. Now, that seemed a little bit suspicious, actually. Something feels inherently more complex about saying that there are 180 degrees in every triangle than saying that I can connect a line segment between two points. So the goal of mathematics after Euclid was to try to prove or disprove this postulate using the other four postulates. Basically, mathematicians were trying to conclusively say whether an assumption was right or wrong. And for the next 2,000 years, mathematicians tried and failed time and time again 
to prove or disprove the parallel postulate using the other four. And it wasn't until 1824 with a mathematician by the name of Carl Friedrich Gauss that we all finally got some relief. Now Gauss's strategy was different. Instead of trying to prove or disprove the parallel postulate, Gauss instead imagined a world in which the postulate was never even made. Basically, Gauss put himself in a world where triangles didn't have to have 180 degrees, and he asked himself the question, what would this world look like? And by absolving himself of that burden of right or wrong, he had freed his imagination to see what math had missed for over 2,000 years. And that is, what if the paper that the triangle is drawn on was just bent? All right. <laughs> so I ask you, geometry up until that point had been completely reliant on the fact that there are 180 degrees in a triangle. And that same geometry we all learned in school. So why did we all learn this geometry in school if it was wrong? And the answer to that question is, it's not wrong. You see, this geometry, now known as Euclidean geometry, is completely valid so long as we're on a flat piece of paper. And more off, it's incredibly useful. I mean, I use things like the Pythagorean theorem every single day of my life. So instead of crumbling down Euclid's 463 propositions, instead, we just recognize them as valid so long as we're working on a flat piece of paper. And that can be represented by a new feature on our geometry. In particular, it can be represented by a branch, where the branching point is the parallel postulate. Okay. Furthermore, Euclid's first 28 propositions, including the one that I showed you earlier, were not reliant on the fact that there are 180 degrees in a triangle. Therefore, those 28 propositions are shared by both Euclidean geometry and non-Euclidean geometry. And finally, just to round out this entire concept of this geometry, further branches up the tree could be the result of other assumptions being recognized as valid or invalid. For example, uh, within the scope of non-Euclidean geometries, there's two possibilities. Every triangle could have more than 180 degrees, or uh, every triangle could have less than 180 degrees. So the question or the assumption, there are more than 180 degrees in a triangle, could very well be another branch on the non-Euclidean side. So you could see how these concepts of branches could keep working, and you could get this giant tree out of it. Now those branches, they might seem like simple little differences, but when you start stacking assumptions and propositions and proofs on top of them, they can yield incredible differences in perspectives. For example, I want you to imagine how different the geometries of Euclid and Gauss would have looked like. Euclid, standing atop 435 unique statements about what the geometric world looks like, would perceive something like this. And meanwhile, Gauss would perceive something like this. And I find that fascinating, because that incredible difference in viewpoint, that incredible difference in perspective, was just the result of a change in one assumption very far down the tree. So, I think that there's a bigger lesson here to be learned than just mathematics. Maybe a lesson about the very nature of a perspective and about the very nature of right and wrong. You see, Gauss understood that Euclid's geometry was just the consequence of one set of assumptions, and that by changing an assumption, he could create a completely different and completely valid geometry. And in the same light, I think that someone's perspective on the world is the consequence of a set of assumptions or beliefs, and that by changing one of those beliefs, somebody else could have a completely different, completely valid perspective on the world. Now, if you let that sink in for a second, um, it doesn't sound like a profound insight. I basically just told you that two people with two different sets of beliefs see the world in two different ways, and guess what? Maybe nobody's right or wrong. I mean, that doesn't shock me by any stretch of the imagination. But what I do think is a profound insight is Gauss's strategy for discovering a new perspective. Right? And in that light, I want to show you Gauss's four simple steps to stepping into someone else's shoes. Okay? So I think that Gauss's strategy for discovering a new geometry can be applied to discovering someone else's perspective on the world. Okay? 
So first step, to understand your geometry. And I'm sure everybody here is getting absolutely sick of this pun, and hopefully you will not forget it. But to be honest, in order to understand someone else's perspective on the world, you first have to accept that your perspective of the world is different, and that it's probably due to a difference in beliefs. And these beliefs could be influenced by anything, uh, maybe cultural customs, maybe religious practices, uh, maybe family traditions, or maybe childhood experiences. And now once you've understood that, you can move to step two, which is to find your parallel postulate. You need to find that one belief or multiple beliefs that are the cause of your two differences in perspectives, right? And keep in mind, just how Euclid's and Gauss's geometries looked incredibly different as the result of a change in one assumption very far down the tree, your two perspectives is, could be extremely different as the result of a change in belief very far down the tree. Now, once you've identified that belief or those beliefs, you can move on to step three, which is to set aside the notion of right and wrong. And I think that this is the biggest lesson that we can learn from this story. Remember, worrying about whether an assumption was right or wrong got mathematics literally nowhere for 2,000 years. And it wasn't until Gauss set aside that notion of right and wrong that he was able to see this beautiful other geometry. Right? In the same light, I think that we get so caught up that once we've identified we have a difference in belief with somebody, that we start worrying so much about whether whose belief is right and whose belief is wrong, right? That even if we were trying to see the other person's perspective to start with, we blocked our mind from even seeing that entire beautiful other branch. And once you've done that very important step, you can move on to step four, which is to climb the other branch. Basically, you need to perform the same exact thought experiment that Gauss did. And that is, ask yourself the question, what would my world look like if I had the alternate belief or if I had a different belief? And now that's easier said than done. I mean, to be honest, it took Gauss years to see geometry without the parallel postulate. But you'll have a distinct advantage over Gauss, and that is that you have somebody with the perspective that you're trying to see sitting across the table from you right now. So, I mean, do whatever you can. Ask them questions. Do whatever you can. Keep an open mind to see their side of the world. And I think that those four steps are powerful, right? Because I personally believe that they give out a method for any two people from any two cultural, religious, or political backgrounds to see the world from someone else's perspective. And seeing the world from someone else's perspective is the first step in reconciling our differences as people, as families, as religions, as cultures, and as countries. So to put it simply, I think that Gauss gave us a better mathematics, but I think that by using his strategy, we can make a better world. Thank you.